Hello everyone and welcome to the channel. Today we're going to look at the NICE guidelines on CKD. My name is Fernando Florido and I'm a GP in the United Kingdom. Remember that there's also a podcast version of these videos, so have a look in the description below. Right, so let's get started. The first thing that I want to say is that obviously this video is a summary of the guideline. I have removed anything that I thought was common sense advice, for example involving patients in the decision-making process, offer information, etc. But on this occasion I have removed all aspects about children and young people with CKD. Although their management is very similar to adults in many ways, most patients with CKD that we will see in general practice will be adults, and this is why I have focused on them. In terms of measuring kidney function, we will look at the EGFR. We need to remember that the E in EGFR means estimated, and that EGFR creatinine may be less reliable in certain situations, for example, acute kidney injury, pregnancy, edematous states, and it has not been well validated in certain ethnic groups, for example, black and Asian ethnic groups. Also, reduced muscle mass will lead to overestimation and increased muscle mass to underestimation of the EGFR. And therefore, we will need to interpret EGFR creatinine with caution in extremes of muscle mass, for example, in bodybuilders, amputation or muscle wasting disorders. And we shouldn't forget to advise patients not to eat any meat in the 12 hours before having a blood test for EGFR creatinine. This is because meat contains creatinine, so when you eat meat, the serum creatinine naturally increases. Serum creatinine is used in EGFR calculations, and so eating less or no meat will cause the creatinine to fall and consequently the EGFR to improve. The EGFR value is given as a whole number if it is 90 or less, and as a greater than 90 when it's over 90. If the EGFR is greater than 90, we will use an increase in the serum creatinine of more than 20% to infer a significant reduction in kidney function. We need to interpret the EGFR values of 60 or more with caution as estimates of GFR become less accurate as the true GFR increases. And we will also confirm a first ever EGFR result of less than 60 by repeating it within two weeks. When it comes to proteinuria, we will not use reagent strips to detect it. We will instead use urine ACR, albumin creatinine ratio, rather than protein creatinine ratio, because of the greater sensitivity for low levels of proteinuria. However, when the ACR is 70 or more, PCR can be used as an alternative to ACR. If we get an ACR between 3 and 70, we will need to repeat it in a subsequent early morning sample to confirm the result. A repeat sample is not needed if the initial ACR level is 70 mg per millimole or more. We must regard an ACR of 3 mg per millimole or more as clinically important proteinuria. And we will routinely measure ACR in diabetes, both type 1 and type 2, people with an EGFR less than 60, or people with an EGFR of 60 or more if there's a strong suspicion of CKD. If unexplained proteinuria is found on a reagent strip, we need to offer testing for CKD using EGFR creatinine and ACR. When it comes to hematuria, we will use reagent strips to test for it, and we will evaluate further for results of 1 plus or higher. We will not use urine microscopy to confirm a positive result, because red blood cells may not be seen in microscopy in hemolyzed hematuria. We will regard two out of three positive reagent strip tests as confirmation of persistent invisible hematuria. Persistent invisible hematuria with or without proteinuria should prompt investigation for urinary tract malignancy in appropriate age groups. Persistent invisible hematuria in the absence of proteinuria should be followed up annually with repeat testing for hematuria, proteinuria or albuminuria, GFR and blood pressure monitoring as long as the hematuria persists. There are certain patients who should regularly be tested for CKD. We will monitor GFR at least annually if medicines that can adversely affect kidney function, 
such as calcineurin inhibitors, for example, cyclosporin or trachylimus, lithium or non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs are given. We will also do EGFR creatinine and ACR to people with any of the following risk factors diabetes, hypertension, previous episode of acute kidney injury, cardiovascular disease such as ischemic heart disease, chronic heart failure, peripheral vascular disease or cerebral vascular disease, structural renal tract disease, recurrent renal calcula or prostatic hypertrophy, multi-system diseases with potential kidney involvement, for example systemic lupus, also gout, family history of end-stage renal failure or hereditary kidney disease. We'll also have to do it following incidental detection of hematuria or proteinuria. We will also monitor people for the development or progression of CKD for at least three years after acute kidney injury longer for people with acute kidney injury stage 3, even if the EGFR has returned to baseline. There is a classification of CKD depending on the ACR levels, that's A1, A2 and A3, and the GFR level, that is G1 to G5. A1 is when the ACR is less than 3 mg per millimole, A2 is when the ACR is 3 to 30, A3 is when ACR is over 30. G1 is when GFR is 90 or over, G2 is when GFR is between 60 and 89, G3A between 45 and 59, G3B between 30 and 44, G4 when it is between 15 and 29, and G5 when the GFR is under 15. We need to be aware that an increased ACR and decreased GFR is associated with increased risk of adverse outcomes and also that increased ACR and decreased GFR in combination multiply this risk. The classification table, table 1, with a risk assessment of every category can be found in the video description. We will offer a renal ultrasound scan to all adults with CKD who have accelerated progression of CKD and we will look at the definition of this later. Also those who have visible or persistent invisible hematuria, those who have symptoms of urinary obstruction, those who have a family history of polycystic kidney disease and are older than 20, those who have a GFR of less than 30, and those who are considered by a nephrologist to need a renal biopsy. When it comes to the frequency of monitoring, we will bear in mind that CKD is not progressive in many people. There's also a table, table 2, to guide the minimum frequency of EGFR creatinine monitoring depending on the CKD classification. You can see this table in the video description too. Generally, it would be once a year for G1, G2 and G3A if the ACR is less than 30 twice a year for G3A, A3, that is an ACR more than 30, and also G3B and G4 if the ACR less than 30. We will do it three times a year for G4A3, that is an ACR more than 30, and four times a year or more for G5. Monitoring should be tailored according to the underlying cause, the rate of decline in EGFR or increase in ACR, other risk factors including heart failure, diabetes, hypertension, changes to the treatment such as ACE inhibitors or ARBs, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and diuretics, and also depending on intercurrent illnesses, for example acute kidney injury. Now we will define accelerated progression of CKD as a sustained decrease in GFR of 25% or more and a change in GFR category within 12 months, or a sustained decrease in GFR of 15 per year. These people are at high risk of progression to end-stage renal disease. If we're worried and we want to identify the rate of progression of CKD, we will obtain a minimum of three GFRs over no fewer than 90 days. If we see a low GFR for the first time, we will repeat the GFR within two weeks to exclude acute deterioration, for example acute kidney injury, or secondary to starting an ACE inhibitor or ARB. 
Risk factors for CKD progression are cardiovascular disease, proteinuria, previous episode of acute kidney injury, hypertension, diabetes, smoking, African or African Caribbean or Asian family origin, chronic use of non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, and untreated urinary outflow tract obstruction. When it comes to patient education, we will encourage exercise, a healthy weight and stop smoking. We will also offer dietary advice about potassium, phosphate, calorie and salt intake, appropriate to the severity of the CKD, but we will not offer low-protein diets. There is a four-variable kidney failure risk equation that can be used to give information about the five-year risk of needing renal replacement. Those who are interested in it can find more details in the video description. We will refer for specialist assessment if they have a five-year risk of needing renal replacement therapy of greater than 5%. Also, if they have an ACR of 30 mg per millimole or more, unless known to be caused by diabetes and already appropriately treated. An ACR of more than 30, that is an ACR category A3, together with hematuria. Accelerated progression of CKD, that is a sustained decrease in eGFR of 25% or more and a change in GFR category within 12 months or a sustained decrease in eGFR of 15 or more per year. We will also refer those with poorly controlled hypertension despite four antihypertensive medicines, also those known or suspected of rare or genetic causes of CKD and also those suspected of renal artery stenosis. We will refer people with CKD and renal outflow obstruction to urological services. When it comes to blood pressure control in adults with CKD and an ACR under 70, we will aim for a clinic blood pressure below 140 over 90. However, in CKD and an ACR of 70 or more, we will aim for a clinic blood pressure below 130 over 80. In order to treat hypertension, if the ACR is 30 or less, that is ACR categories A1 and A2, we will simply follow the NICE guideline on hypertension, and you can check out the corresponding episode on this channel. But for people with CKD who have hypertension and an ACR over 30, that is an ACR category of A3, we will definitely offer an A or B or an ACE inhibitor, and we will titrate it to the highest licensed dose that the person can tolerate. If they also have diabetes, we will also give an ARB or an ACE inhibitor if the ACR is 3 or more. SGLT2 inhibitors have been proven to help CKD in both people with and without diabetes. The guidance on their use is outside the scope of this guideline, but I will put links in the guidance in the description below. Going back to ARBs and ACE inhibitors, we will not offer a combination of both these agents together. We will measure potassium and the eGFR before starting an ARB or ACE inhibitor and between one or two weeks after starting treatment and after every dose increase. More frequent monitoring of serum potassium may be needed if medicines known to promote hyperkalemia are prescribed alongside them. We will not routinely offer an ARB or ACE inhibitor if the pretreatment potassium is greater than 5. In these cases, we will assess for and treat any other factors that promote hyperkalemia and recheck the serum potassium concentration. We will stop ARBs and ACE inhibitors if the potassium level increases to 6 or more and other medicines known to promote hyperkalemia have been discontinued. Because of their mode of action, ARBs and ACE inhibitors can reduce the GFR and increase the creatinine levels. However, after starting or increasing the dose of an ACE inhibitor or ARB, we will not modify the dose if either the GFR decrease from pretreatment baseline is less than 25% or the serum creatinine increase from baseline is less than 30%. In these cases, we will repeat the tests in one to two weeks and we will not change anything if the decrease in EGFR remains less than 25% or the increase in creatinine remains less than 30%.
If the EGFR decreases 25% or more, or the increase in creatinine is 30% or more, we will investigate other causes of deterioration in kidney function, such as volume depletion or concurrent medication, for example, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. And if no other cause for the deterioration is found, we will stop the ARB or ACE inhibitor, or reduce the dose to a previously tolerated lower dose and add an alternative hypertensive medication if needed. The advice on statins in CKD is covered in a different NICE guideline. I will put the link to it in the video description too. We will offer antiplatelet medicines only for the secondary prevention of cardiovascular disease, but we need to be aware of the increased risk of bleeding in CKD patients. When it comes to anemia, we will consider investigating and managing anemia of CKD if the HB level falls below 110 grams per litre or less, or they develop symptoms attributable to anemia such as tiredness, shortness of breath, lethargy and palpitations. And in people with anemia, if the EGFR is above 60, we will investigate other causes as it, the anemia is unlikely to be due to CKD. If the EGFR is between 30 and 60, we will investigate the causes of anemia, but we will use our clinical judgment to decide how extensive this investigation should be, because the anemia may be caused by CKD. If EGFR is below 30, we will think about other causes of anemia, but we will note that anemia is often caused by CKD in these circumstances. We will need to determine the iron status in these cases and we will need to test for iron deficiency every three months or every one to three months if hemodialysis is being used. And to diagnose iron deficiency we will use the percentage of hyperchromic red blood cells which would be more than 6% and if this is not possible we will use the reticulocyte hemoglobin content which should be less than 29 picograms. And if these tests are not available, or the person has thalassemia or thalassemia trait, we will use a combination of transferrin saturation and serum ferritin measurements. Transferrin saturation should be less than 20% to confirm iron deficiency, or serum ferritin should be less than 100 to confirm it. However, from a general point of view, we will not routinely use transferrin saturation or serum ferritin measurements alone to assess iron deficiency status in people with anemia of CKD. Equally, we will not routinely measure erythropoietin levels for the diagnosis or management of anemia of CKD. In order to manage the anemia, there is separate guidance, and I will put the link to it in the video description. But the management of anemia in CKD is based on iron therapy, erythropoietic stimulating agents, or ESAs, and blood transfusions. We will not start ESA therapy without managing possible iron deficiency first. In people treated with iron, serum ferritin levels should not rise above 800. In order to prevent this, we will review the dose of iron when serum ferritin levels reach 500. We will not prescribe androgens, supplements of vitamin C, folic acid or carnitine as adjuvants specifically for the treatment of anemia of CKD but we will treat clinically relevant hyperparathyroidism to improve the management of the anemia. We will avoid blood transfusions in people in whom kidney transplant is an option. This is because exposure to multiple blood donations may cause alloimmunization to human leukocyte antigen or HLA class 1 antigens on white blood cells. HLA antibodies can react with the transplanted kidney leading to higher rates of acute rejection and poorer long-term graft survival. However, the risk of aluminization has reduced since the introduction of universal leukodepletion of blood components. The dose and frequency of ESA should be determined by the duration of action and route of administration of the ESA, and it should be adjusted to give the rate of HB increase between 10 and 20 grams per litre per month. And we will not routinely correct hemoglobin to normal levels with ESAs in people with anemia of CKD. We will typically maintain the aspirational hemoglobin range 
between 100 and 120 grams per liter. To keep the HP level within the aspirational range, we will not wait until the HP levels are outside the aspirational range before adjusting treatment. For example, we will take action when HP levels are within 5 grams per liter of the range's limit, that is 105 and 115 grams per liter. There is MHRA advice on the prescribing of ESAs. I will put in the video description the link to these details. In particular, we will follow their advice to avoid HP levels above 120 grams per liter because of the increased risk of death and serious adverse cardiovascular events in people with CKD. We will use the lowest dose of ECA to provide adequate control of the anemia symptoms and we will consider accepting hemoglobin levels below the aspirational range if high doses of ESAs are needed to achieve the aspirational range or the aspirational range is not achieved despite escalating ESA doses. The use of ACE inhibitors and ARBs is not precluded, but if they're used, we need to be aware that an increase in ESA therapy may be needed. We will offer iron to people with anemia of CKD who are receiving ESAs to achieve a percentage of hyperchromic red blood cells less than 6%, unless the ferritin is greater than 800 micrograms per liter. Also, a reticulocyte HP count or equivalent above 29 picograms, unless again the serum ferritin is greater than 100. And if these tests are not available or the person has thalassemia or thalassemia trait, iron therapy should maintain transferrin saturation greater than 20% and serum ferritin level greater than 100 micrograms per liter, unless serum ferritin is greater than 800 again. Most adults will need 500 to 1000 milligrams of iron in a single or divided dose, depending on the preparation. Intravenous iron should be administered in a setting with facilities for resuscitation. For people who are not having hemodialysis, we will consider a trial of oral iron before offering intravenous iron therapy. If they are intolerant of oral iron or the target HB levels are not reached within three months, we will offer intravenous iron therapy. For people who are having hemodialysis, we will offer intravenous iron therapy. We will offer oral iron therapy to people who are having hemodialysis only if the intravenous iron therapy is contraindicated or the person chooses not to have it. We will also offer intravenous iron therapy to adults with anemia of CKD who are iron deficient and who are receiving ESA therapy. In these cases, we will only offer oral iron if intravenous iron therapy is contraindicated or the person, again, chooses not to have it. When offering intravenous iron therapy to people not having hemodialysis, we will consider high-dose, low-frequency intravenous iron as a treatment of choice. And high-dose and low-frequency iron is a maximum of two infusions with a minimum of 500 mg of iron in each infusion for adults. Low dose and high frequency is more than two infusions with 100 to 200 mg of iron in each. We will not check iron levels earlier than one week after intravenous iron and we will carry out routine ferritin every one to three months to prevent iron overload. In anemia of CKD, we will monitor HP every two to four weeks in the induction phase of ESA therapy and every one to three months in the maintenance phase of ESA therapy and more frequently after ESA dose changes. After other causes of anemia have been excluded, we will regard anemia of CKD as resistant to ESA when an aspirational HB range is not achieved despite high doses of ESAs, or there's a continued need for the administration of high doses of ESAs to maintain the aspirational HB range. In people with CKD, pure red cell aplasia is indicated by a low reticulocyte count together with anemia and the presence of neutralizing antibodies. In addition, aluminum toxicity should be considered as a potential cause of ESA resistance after other causes have been excluded. If aluminum toxicity is suspected in a person with anemia of CKD having hemodialysis, we will need to test for desferioxamine and review the management. We will consider specialist referral for people with ESA-induced pure red cell aplasia. 
We will take into account symptoms, quality of life, underlying conditions and the chance of future successful kidney transplant in addition to HB levels when thinking about the need for red cell transfusions. Hyperphosphatemia in people with CKD stage 4 or 5 can be common and when it comes to managing hyperphosphatemia, specialist renal dietitian should be involved. And before starting phosphate binders, we will optimize diet and dialysis for people who are having this. We will first offer adults with CKD stage 4 or 5 and hyperphosphatemia calcium acetate to control the serum phosphate levels. We will then offer Sevelamer carbonate if calcium acetate is not indicated, for example because of hypercalcemia or low serum parathyroid hormone levels, or not tolerated. If calcium acetate and Sevelamer carbonate cannot be used, we will consider sucroferric oxyhydroxide for adults and dialysis if a calcium-based phosphate binder is not needed, or calcium carbonate if a calcium-based phosphate binder is needed. And we will only consider lanthanum carbonate if other phosphate binders cannot be used. If patients remain hyperphosphatemic after taking the maximum dose of a calcium-based phosphate binder, we will check that they're taking it as prescribed and we will consider combining a calcium-based phosphate binder with a non-calcium-based phosphate binder titrating the dose to achieve the best possible control of the serum phosphate while keeping the serum calcium levels below the upper normal limit. At every routine clinical review, we will assess the person's phosphate, taking into account the diet, whether they're taking the phosphate binder as prescribed, and other relevant factors such as vitamin D levels, serum parathyroid hormone levels, alkaline sulfatase, serum calcium, medications that may affect serum phosphate or dialysis. There are other complications in CKD such as the effect on bone metabolism and osteoporosis. We will not routinely measure calcium, phosphate, parathyroid hormone and vitamin D levels in adults with an eGFR of 30 or more, that is a GFR category G1, G2 or G3. But we will measure serum calcium, phosphate and parathyroid hormone in people with GFR of less than 30, that is GFR category G4 or G5. We will offer biphosphonates if indicated for the prevention and treatment of osteoporosis in adults with a GFR of 30 or more, that is GFR category G1, G2 or G3. We will not routinely offer vitamin D supplementation to manage or prevent CKD mineral and bone disorders, but we will offer colecalciferol or ergocalciferol to treat proven vitamin D deficiency. If vitamin D deficiency has been corrected and symptoms of CKD mineral and bone disorders persist, we will offer alpha-calcidol or calcitriol to people with an eGFR of less than 30, and we will monitor the calcium and phosphate levels. Finally, we will consider oral sodium bicarbonate supplementation if both the eGFR level is less than 30 and the serum bicarbonate concentration is less than 20. We have come to the end of this video. I hope that you have found it useful and if so, please hit the like and subscribe buttons. Thank you for watching and goodbye.